So what about you is too small? What seems overwhelming to face because there's that thing about you that's too tiny and rather underwhelming to put up against it. Well, all is not lost. Don't give up hope. It's not impossible until three things about you become too impossibly small. And none of these can be made bigger by a pill. But they can be hard to swallow. And I will pray to be good. And it's time for another unbuckled, bumpy ride with your guide, the stark raving lunatic himself. I'm Jim. Let's jump right in again. Welcome to my podcast based on my brand new book, available on Amazon, Live Life Lean, L-E-A-N. It's a year-long guide to gratitude and our daily grind. The book that combines some timeless wisdom from a whole lot of the world's wiser people with the reflections, reactions, and wisecracks of the guide's author, me. And it guides you, the reader, through the simplest system for a happy, healthy, authentic, and genuinely grateful everyday experience. I urge you to get the book. Of course I do. I wrote it. It's either at Amazon or at my website, ampurage.com, A-M-M-P-U-R-A-G-E. But even without it, let's make next week better than last, our next year better than the past, and get started now with today's episode of... Okay, y'all, stand back. There's just no telling how big this thing can get. Pretty sure that was a punchline from some stand-up comedian in like the 1980s. And pretty sure he was referencing something most people would rather not be exposed to. And didn't care how big it got. Or it could just stay small and out of sight, you know, out of sight, out of mind. But what if? What if what that comedian said back in the 1980s was the visionary motto for our tomorrows? And we started following it today. Hmm. Stand back. We don't know how big this thing can get. How big this thing we say we want in life. We want to do in life, want to build, want to be. How big this thing can get. But there's something so big, so huge and inspiring. Well, it might seem almost impossible, even if what's holding us back is something that we think is too small, right? Where are we going here? Well, in reality... There are only three things that could hold you back from making the impossible possible. Just three things. There's three things that could make it virtually impossible to ever follow through and find out. And as I said before, if these three things, these three things about you are too small, well, the likelihood of overcoming what seems impossible will seem too big. But these three things about you are yours to choose to view as you see fit to. Now, what are those three things? The three that you just cannot allow yourself to allow to be seen as too small? They are your God, your thing you want to do, and you. See, stuff only becomes impossible when and if I am too small. I see me as incapable, incalculably small, and insignificantly aligned with my cause. Stuff only becomes impossible when and if I see it as too small. I mean, you stop and think, this thing that I want, that I want to do, how important is it really? Is it really going to make that big a difference? It only becomes impossible when and if I see God as too small. See, it's not about how big my faith is, my faith in all of this. It's about how big the God that I have all my faith in, in all of this is. So let's address this mess one at a time. First, when our God is too small. Let's be honest, sometimes some folks don't try things and they blame God or they blame life or fate or the universal creational source or the Wizard of Freaking Oz. However they see God, sometimes folks blame that. They blame that, well, God is not big enough to be enough, not involved 
big enough, not interested in us big enough, not invested in us big enough, not big enough to have a plan big enough to make room for and include our little thingy. So we may ask, why should I build up my hope and faith in a God that ain't showing up big enough? Hmm? See, when we do not start something or face or begin some challenge because our faith is too small, because we feel in our hearts that we just don't believe enough, at least enough, not yet, then what we're doing is we're actually keeping our faith from growing big enough to believe enough. And we're blaming how we see God for how we feel God sees us and what we want to do in the world. Our faith is small because faith isn't supposed to be faith in ourselves or even faith in our faith itself. It, it, it isn't supposed to be only about how, quote, I have faith in my belief, in myself, in my faith. That's a really small circle that seems to chase its own tail. Well, if that were big enough, you'd have either already done those big things by now or at least started them and be on your way to unstoppable. And are you ever really unstoppable? Ever feel 100% of the time unstoppable? Really? Whatever, whoever, however it is that you choose to acknowledge God or your creator, or the universal life force, or baby Jesus in a NASCAR tracksuit, whatever, however you view it, if the reason that you do not attempt is because your faith in that feels too small, then what you're actually putting your faith in is yourself. Because that's the limiting size that you're seeing. You're seeing that your faith is too small. Faith in a universally life-creating force, or God, or you name it. But as what you're trying to do unfolds, see, that's when your small today faith can grow big tomorrow. If you don't try to define that that universally creating life, all-powerful force of God is too small. Impossible happens to be how we feel when the biggest thing possible, God, is made too small. Small enough for us to, to put it in a box and seal it inside of a neat little Tupperware in the refrigerator. Clear plastic so we can see what we put inside. And we sealed it tight to keep it ready to use when we conveniently want it again. A guy named Rick Warren once said, If God was small enough for you to completely understand Him, He wouldn't be big enough for you to completely trust him. Now, I usually repeat my own stuff, but that one there is too sweet to not repeat, so I'll say it again. Quote, If God was small enough for you to completely understand him, he wouldn't be big enough for you to completely trust him. They've said that it's not how big the size of the dog in the fight is. It's the size of how big is the fight in the dog. But here, that's backwards. And it's all kind of backwards, from metaphysical to metaphorical to alphabetical. So let me spell it out for you. It's not the size of faith you have in God. It's the size of the God that you have faith in. That's how impossible gets faced. How big is God? Stop right there. You're wrong. You're wrong. You want to know why? Because if you can even imagine it, it ain't big enough. If your brain can wrap itself around God, then God is too small. So whenever we, whenever you or I, start to think that God is too small to pull something off, or we start to believe God is involved in too small a way, too small a way to be aware of our day-to-day, -day, or that God is too busy to remember us when we pray, whenever our minds tell us that we are alone in this challenge because God ain't showing up big enough to know what's going on, to see what's going on or do the right thing, the best thing about what's going on, when we hear our minds saying that, saying that to our hearts, we are what's making something impossible. Remember my favorite quote from the most underquoted philosophical book by St. Emo Phillips. The book of Emo, 24-7, <laughs> it reminds us I used to think the human mind was the most amazing thing in the universe. And then I remembered what was telling me to believe that. See, when whatever we have faith in is too small to measure up and match up, impossible seems to be what adds up because we see God as too small. So, 
how to resolve this, how do we solve this, humanly and humbly acknowledge and accept that how big your faith in something is does not define how big it actually is. Because we don't get to define or set limits on what we did not create, what theoretically created us, created you. So if your faith feels small, that's okay. Because it is small. It's supposed to be small. Compared to what you're having faith in, it should always be smaller by comparison. It'd be foolish to have a faith that is bigger than what you have faith in. But, listen, when you and I, when us, when we're not trying based on how we feel that our faith is too small, though that is 100% human, it is backwards. Because it's not about the size of the faith you have in your deity, it's about the size of the deity in which you have faith. History has so many different, countless examples of people healed and helped and saved. Did they all have identically sized faith or an identically sized God? Yep, it was the God. So remember, it's not about the size of the faith you have in the deity. It's about the size of the deity in which you have faith. Get it backwards, so much seems impossible. Get it right, and impossible begins to seem, well, so kind of backwards. I mean, really, final thing here, ask this question. Inside or out loud, ask it and experience just how backwards it feels. Ask, what if the God that created everything is too small? Now, let that settle in. And now that we've addressed the evangelical elephant in the room, <clears throat> God, if God, the universal life force, is not too small to help us overcome feeling something is impossible, could it be either the it thing or the me thing that's the problem? Now then, when we look at those other two too small to make the call things, the it's too small and unimportant thing, and the I'm too small and not big enough stuff, the me and the it of all of it being seen as too small, what do you wish and want to do in the world that feels important but sometimes feels impossible? Some things feel as impossible to, to make happen, to achieve. It's like, it's like stapling water to a tree. It's just frustrating. And some things are impossible because they're not supposed to be achieved, like slamming a revolving door. Go try it. It's frustrating, but it's funny to watch at the same time. But slamming a revolving door, stapling water to a tree, could you see trying these things? I mean, what's the purpose? I've wondered about my purpose-driven projects at times. Have you? Have you ever wondered if the right thing, the right time, the right fit, you know, me for it? From me first envisioning really exploding personal fitness training services in a smaller Midwestern manufacturing town about 30 years ago when I, I came out here from California, to me getting to help save and change lives every day for people with Parkinson's, to believing that I can actually help spread gratitude on demand in the palm of our hands, and then writing a book about it, to now me wanting to spread great news about the power that we all have through accepting instinctive inclusion and doing so through my speaking. I've wondered, I've really wondered at times if it was big enough to matter, to make a difference, or if I was too small to pull it all off. You ever have those talks with yourself? The talks inside between your head and your heart, so you say, but this thing I want to do, maybe it's not really all that important. Maybe it's not going to really make that big a difference. Am I just stapling water to a tree? Reminds me of a quote from that make a difference, badass, beautiful woman, Mother Teresa. She once said that, quote, we know only too well that what we are doing is nothing more than a drop in the ocean. But if the drop were not there, the ocean would be missing something. And when, and when I read that, I thought this, yeah, the ocean would be missing something. And it may be missing the first drop that started the whole thing. Because every ocean began with one original drop. Now, if that drop were you, without you, where would that ocean be? Without you, it may not be. Ripples and waves, call it whatever you want. Compound interest, a domino effect, whatever you want to call it. It's outcome only becomes impossible if you, if we, see it as too small to start, too small to invest in, and too small to see it through. But it's not just the drop in the ocean that your project may seem to be. It's also like the seed that you may actually be in this forest. 
See, when we see a seed, a tiny seed, and if we'll just kind of see ourselves as just seeds, what we see can seem so small, but there are two views to see it through, the anatomical and the analytical view. Consider a seed, think about one in your head, same single seed, two ways to view it. One, the anatomical view, what the thing is composed and made up of, DNA and fiber and tissue. And the analytical view, what's this thing capable of? Ask, how big can this become? Stand back, folks. We don't know how big this thing is going to get. See, the analytical view is to analyze. Definition of analysis or the definition of to analyze is, quote, to discover or reveal something through detailed examination. Examine all the details, big and small, to reveal and to discover. Reveal and bring out what is now hidden. Discover to find out what is not yet found. When we stare at and insist on seeing only what we can see now, the seed itself, us as the small seed itself, we see anatomically. But when we dare to see what this thing can be, we see analytically. We discover what it is capable of becoming, what we are. Now, I'll bet you're thinking, here comes Jim preaching on the whole mustard seed and how the Bible says it's the smallest and grows the biggest. But the Bible's wrong. It's wrong there because it's not the smallest, nowhere near. But then again, that Bible is not a book on horticulture. It just stands for B-I-B-L-E, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. No, you want to think of the seed that is just too small to make a difference kind of seed, that type of potential? Think about the sequoia. Go ahead, look at redwoods. Look at sequoias. The seeds are about the same size as a tomato seed, and the tree grows into the tallest plants on earth, like 375, 380 feet tall. The giant sequoia actually has seeds which are a little smaller, about the size of a pinhead, and they're a little shorter than the redwoods, but they are massive in girth. <laughs> and yeah, girth matters. So seek to see our God, our something special we want, and to see ourselves not just with anatomical eyes, but with analytical vision to reveal and discover not just what it consists of, but what all three are capable of, capable of and getting the job done. When it comes to your lumber, getting the job done, Mr. Paul Bunyan, your pencil might be mightier than the sword you think is necessary to get the job done. You may think you got no chance to step up to the plate and hit one out of the park because the bat you're swinging ain't big enough that you're up there facing 100 mile an hour fastballs from life and you're swinging with a pencil. Well, like another comedian once said about his famously pencil-sized personal package, it's how the pencil writes that matters. That's what he said. And I think he threw in a biatch after that. See, take what's small, write 10 feet tall, write it in cursive, calligraphy, street graffiti, but whatever pencil that you're swinging, it's only too small if all you focus on is the bat you're supposed to have. So they say, listen, if the pen is mightier than the sword, well, imagine what your pencil can do with its mistake-correcting capabilities. Can you say eraser? Only mistakes that your pencil can't correct is the ones that they never wrote, where it was never used, where you never left your mark because you saw what you and your pencil could do as too little and too few because you saw it as too small. When it comes to the potential that something or that someone would he or would he not be able to lumber through, God, sorry for the puns, guys. Don't forget that funny man who warned you not to stand too close to a naked man and to stand back because we don't know how big something can get. So earlier on, I referenced that comedian who in the 80s and 90s did a stand-up bit about stand back. We don't know how big this thing can get. And I think it also referenced something about don't stand too close to a naked man or something like that. Well, that comedian was born in Denver, Colorado, June 13th, 1953, was given at birth the family name, Timothy Dick. According to his bio, young Timothy Dick was teased about his last name, Dick and that being teased actually provided him the chance early on to use humor as a defense mechanism, a defense mechanism that he used to stay alive years later when in prison, sharing a holding cell with 20 other men who all had to share publicly one stainless steel toilet out in the middle of the cell room. A new appreciation for potty mouth toilet humor, I suppose. 
But when facing conviction for drug trafficking and intelligently was willing to make a deal with the government, he changed his ways. He turned informant, he snitched out 20 drug dealers, helping cops take them out of the drug scene. This lessened his sentence to give his future any hope at all. The man who was born Timothy Dick changed. And he so charmed the judge throughout the ordeal that the judge told Timothy that he expected him to, quote, be a very successful comedian someday. Timothy did serve his time, eventually became a world-famous, family-focused, faith-supporting comedian and actor, a producer, and a person who affects change patriotically to this very day. Also, truth be told, young Timothy along the way of growing up and growing older had changed his last name, having dropped the family name of Dick, legally, to forever change from being called, quote, just another Dick. What he became was not just another guy with the last name of Allen, though. See, Timothy Allen, Tim Allen, did not know how big this thing was going to grow. Timothy Dick became Timothy Allen, convict, became Tim Allen, success story. See, your thingy you're thinking of, whatever it is, will seem more impossible when your view of God is too small, when your thingy you want to make happen seems too small, or you see yourself as too small. And sometimes you just need to see how really big, powerful, and important these three actually are. And follow Tim's example and stop being just another dick. And now more words of wisdom to wow your socks off from the Live Life Lean Guide itself. Today's entry from page 108. What the expert said, fate leads him who follows it and drags him who resists. Plutarch. And what your guide heard? Fate is so unprovable, but it gets the credit and or the blame for our track record. So much and so often. So is it fate or is it faith? So what do you think about that? Using the Live Life Lean system? What have you learned recently that's new? What have you earned that wasn't just given to you? Where are you adding to the world that's not just about you? Please reflect on all that, respect it, be grateful for it before you navigate someplace next. Please like, subscribe, and share to show you care. Thank you for listening. I hope you're enjoying your copy of the Live Life Lean, L-E-A-N guide. Enjoying it almost as much as I did creating it. And if you don't have a copy yet, Go on over to Ampurage.com or Amazon and get started today experiencing the amazing power of knowing every day is literally yours to be grateful about and you need never feel unfulfilled again. I'm Jim Hall and until next time, good health, God bless, and now go get a little dirty learning something new, earning what's not given to you, adding to this crazy world that we share and navigating your way to something new and next.